good morning once again, everybody, and hello to everyone that's watching online as well. My name is Eric Beachy, and I am the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time joining with us today, I personally want to say thank you for being our guest. We count it a privilege and an honor that you chose to come here today. If you're watching online, if you're at the lake or at a boat, wherever you're located, we want to welcome you as well. And uh, we wish you were here, uh, not with your bathing suit on, of course, but we wish you were here. <laughs> And, uh, and so it's an honor and a blessing to have you here. Can you guys do me a big, big favor? Can you let everyone know? First of all, I'm going to say something real quick. It's so much better to be here in person. Um, it really is. And, uh, you know, it's, it, thank God that we can go on vacation and we can be part of the community. And if you're not feeling well, you can watch online. But uh, don't make it a habit, everybody. The Bible says do not forsake the gathering together as some has made the habit in doing. Getting together does not mean phoning it in. It means coming together. It's important to be in a room with other believers, to interact with each other. This is how we become stronger and greater together. So I want to let you know the water's warm. It's good here. We'd love to have you. Can you guys do me a big, big favor? Welcome everyone that's watching online and tell them they need to be here nice and loud. Come on. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that because of, because of uh, ego to see seats filled. I'm saying that because it's for your good. And, uh, you know, there's something about coming together you just cannot get online. You just can't. And I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what metaverse you live in, what glasses you have in. But there is an absolute fundamental thing that's happening in our culture today. People are very lonely today. And so we're looking at ways to changing that, to create more community, more opportunities and so we'll be talking more about that next week. We're going to highlight a little bit next week more about our youth ministry next week. So you'll hear about that uh, part of the service as well. But we're so glad that you're here today. And we are in a series called The Sermon on the Mount. And a very apropos topic today about loving your enemies. How many of you love your enemies? How many of you love to hate your enemies? For all you Boston Red Sox fans out there, Yankees are really doing well this year. I'm really happy about that. We're having a great season. Praise the, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about the Boston Red Sox and how they're terrible they're doing, but I'm not going to mention that. But we're talking about, uh, about the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was speaking uh, from chapters 5 to chapter 7. It's his longest discourse in Scripture. It is absolutely astounding and powerful and wonderful. It would change your life like nothing else. And so today we're going to be talking about that. And I just want to remind you of what God has for us he doesn't tell us these things to make our life more difficult. He tells us these things to make our life more complete and more full. He said, I've come that you would have life and you would have it abundantly. The problem is this. We think our abundant life is the American dream. But the American dream will become the American nightmare without God. You see, the dream that God has for you, that you would know him personally, that you would know your creator, he's designed you. He wants to give you an abundant life, everybody. And the way that you and I choose to do it is the wrong way. God has the right way. And so in our culture today, what we're facing, there is hope, there is peace. There's always joy in the Lord. Even in sadness, there's joy. Because we know the best days are ahead in Christ Jesus. And I just wanted to uh, remind you of that today. I also want to tell you a little bit of a story. Back in World War II... If you're not familiar with what happened, it was a horrific time in the world. We had uh, Nazi Germany under the, uh, under the horrific leadership of Adolf Hitler, who was a, 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 a wicked man beyond wicked man. And uh, they were persecuting and they were just exterminating Jews and undesirables in concentration camps. And uh, there were these a Dutch family that was doing all they could. They were believers. They were doing all they could to hide these Jewish people so they would not be gathered up, put in cars, and brought to concentration camps. They did all they could to deal with that. And so that's what they had to do. And this Dutch family, what they did, there was a movie called The Hiding Place and a book by Corey Tamboon. And what they did is they put these babies... I'm sorry. Can you guys do me a big favor? We have a nursery. Uh, I'm having a hard time focusing. If you could be so kind. We love babies, but uh, I'm just not as gifted as I probably should be in regards to babies, cute babies in the front row. I have a, I'm going to go down there and just kiss that baby, and I don't want to do that. And so <laughs> thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. It's just a little bit difficult. Uh, they, weren't hiding, they were hiding babies as well. But they were hiding these people in the walls of the house so that when, Nazi, when the Nazis came, they could not find them. Well, time happened to eventually what took place 
was the Nazis found this Dutch family, the Tamboon family, and they arrested them and they brought them to concentration camps. And Corey was a teenage girl and she had a, she had a sister named Betsy. And in these camps, un, unspeakable, horrific things took place. People were exterminated. They were, they were, they were malnourished. They, were, they would die of starvation. They would die of disease. They were bitten by fleas and all sorts of horrible things. And, and, and Betsy was her sister, and they worked together. They, and there was this horrible guard, this prison guard, this tall man that was over six foot, lanky guy with these sunken eyes. And not only was he a guard, but he also enjoyed inflicting pain on people. He tortured and he liked it. He said all sorts of things to them. He did things that were so inhumane. And she could never forget this wicked man. Well, she got out of the, the war ended. 15 to 20 years have gone by. And she was, began to be a speaker. And she wrote the book called The Hiding Place, which is an amazing, amazing book. And she was traveling around sharing about how God got her through this situation and how God brought liberation and forgiveness. And she thought things were going great. And she spoke at this church in a German village. And she got completed her talk. And then she recognized once the lights went down, she saw a tall, lanky man whose hair was a little more gray. But she recognized those steely, sunken eyes. And immediately, her emotions began to have a flood. She was having a post-traumatic stress type of syndrome where she was going back. She remembered. She could smell the smells. She could feel, she could feel the terror. She could feel the hatred. She could feel all this running through her bloodstream. And, she was, and as she was thinking these things, this man started drawing closer and closer while people were on the line, the reception line, to shake her hand and to talk to her. She could see this man was coming. What am I to do? And as the man came up, the Holy Spirit says, you are to shake his hand and forgive him. And in everything in her body was screaming out. I mean, every, every emotion, terror, anger, all these different emotions, liquid fear, all this stuff was in her. Like, I cannot do that. And here she thought she was over it. She thought she was healed, but a landmine was still in her spirit. And the Holy Spirit said to her, I want you to take his hand say I forgive you. And this man, I don't think he even knew who she was, looked at his Fraulein, because he, she, he knew that she was part of the concentration. Could, you, could God be able to forgive a man like me? And she took her hand, she looked at him in the eye. She says, I forgive you, and God forgives you. And immediately she did that. Everything came off of her, and she was free. I don't think I, I don't know. I don't know if I could do that. But that's an example of loving your enemies and forgiving those who persecute you. I don't think any of us in this room have had a situation quite like that. Maybe you did. And, and I recognize here today that there are people that have been abused, people that have been molested, people that have been maltreated terribly. And maybe inside your heart, you have this something stirring in you. By no means does God ever tell us not to face wickedness and protect people from being hurt. But what he does, he doesn't want that toxicity of that hurt to get on us. We are to defend the powerless. We are to defend those that are weak. And we have a responsibility to love. And love is an action. Love is not weak. Love is strong. Love is powerful. Love protects. And that's all part of it. And today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that is, frankly, extremely difficult. Uh, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and there's been these six statements. There's a sixth statement today. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. Where Jesus was going back, looking at the Jewish law, what was written in the Old Testament, and also the teaching surrounding that, and that things were added on to it. And, uh, and you have to remember, everybody, back in those days, most people did not read and write. So the only way you would know the law is you'd have to hear the law read from your rabbi or someone that could read the scrolls. And so they would hear the scriptures through the rabbis, the teachers. 
and they would dispense it in such a capacity based upon their own interpretation, and that's what you would hear. And it became, quote, unquote, gospel. Like what they said is true. And there were a lot of misnomers out there. And Jesus, what he did is he'd go back and say what the original intent was and bring clarification to it. So here we have the sixth statement today. You've heard. I want to read it first. We're going to look at it, go back to it line by line, verse by verse, and how it applies to our life today, okay? Here we go. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you. Can I hear an amen? amen. I'm saying, oh, no. You say amen. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen. Now, some of you are married to perfect people. How many of you are married to perfect people? <laughs> oh, my gosh, you guys are too honest. <laughs> if you think you're perfect, you got some serious issues. <laughs> so here we are. You have heard that it was said. Again, this is the Jewish law taken by the rabbis, taken by the Mishnah, the Talmud, and different things, and expanded upon, and Jesus is setting it correctly here for us. We went through these different five, now we're going to go to the sixth one. We dealt with murder. We said, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. Jesus not only went to the action, but he went to the very programming that created the action in the first place. If you can get it here in your mind before it gets to the heart, and then you don't have to deal with it with the hand. And so he dealt with the heart in the mind, getting the right thoughts and changing the heart. We talk about lust. If you look at lust with someone in your heart, you committed adultery. We talk about divorce. We talk about making vows. Let your yes be a yes and your no be a no. We talk about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And you are not to resist the evil one. And we went through this line by line, verse by verse. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can look it up. And you can click on it. And you can watch the sermon. Or you can go to Spotify or Apple Tunes and write in there, Cornerstone Cheshire and catch up. I don't have time to go back and go through all those again. But today... We are getting to a new one. And this is what Jesus said to us. And I want to kind of bring a little bit of, go back. I want to look at an eye for an eye. Because eye for an eye and hating your, loving your enemy and today are kind of married to itself together. Even though they're separated, it, you've heard it said. So let's go ahead and go back and read last week's. And we'll go talk this week's. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person... But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. That was last week. You can go back and listen to that last week. And today we're continuing on, love your enemies. How many of you have enemies? Okay, you guys are the most pious and the most godly church in the country. I just want to congratulate you today. There are people that want to do you bad, and there are enemies. And there are people that you want nothing to do with. We all have enemies. People that go against everything we believe in, they're against. We can see it happening more and more and more in our culture that the values that you and I hold are completely different than other people around us. And we're finding that our society and our culture is at odds. If you're, a, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ and you follow the word of God, there is a bigger and bigger gap and a deeper ditch between God's ways and the world's ways. And you and I are becoming strange compared to the world. And many people hate us. And it's easy for us to hate them. So, love your enemies. What does that look like? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
So Jesus is quoting the Old Testament except for the fact you can scour the Old Testament. You can look through it. You can read every single Hebrew scroll and you'll never find hate your enemy anywhere. It did say you shall love your neighbor. It never said hate your enemy. There were Psalms, I hate them with a perfect hatred. There were Psalms that talk about God taking over the enemy and wiping them out. But that was more of a political thing on a national level. It was not an individual level. And never did it tell anyone ever to hate their enemy. So what happened was, the rabbis took this and they twisted it through their traditions. Not all the rabbis, but some of them did. So you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, it's wrong. A lot of things we hear today are wrong. So what did the actual word of God say in Leviticus 19.17? Jesus is quoting this. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Notice, it's dealing with community. So we're talking about the community about them and around them. I mean, it's hard enough to love your family, is it not, everybody? Come on, let's be honest. Especially during Thanksgiving and Christmas. Everyone has an uncle, okay? Anyhow, hopefully I'm not that uncle to my family. But you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. This is the Old Testament. We go on. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge. This is good teaching, everybody. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> bear a grudge against the sons of your own people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see where Jesus got that from? Hello, right? He does not take away the law. He fulfills the law. He says, if anyone, he says, not one punctuation mark is going to pass from the old way. I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. Anyone that teaches you not to follow the law, let him be accursed. Anyone that teaches you to obey the law, let him be blessed. And so this movement today is we have to uncouple. We have to separate the old from the new. No, it's all one Bible. The Bible of the New Testament church, by the way, was the Old Testament with the letters of Paul and a few things that were going around at that time. Okay, so we have to understand that this is very important, the full counsel of the word of God. It says, you shall not bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay? The question is, what's that all about? Well, in Leviticus 19.34, where we have the local community, we have the people you're living with, you have your own town, your own nation, your own country. But what about those on the outside? Well, the Bible dealt with that too, by the way. The Bible was not some hateful book in the Old Testament. God was not some vindictive, angry old man with a cane in his hand and a lightning bolt in his right hand throwing it at people. No, the Old Testament was full of love and grace. The Bible, you don't see, you see, we see hundreds of years compressed in a couple of verses. God would give a culture 500 years to get right with them before he gave his, his judgment. Our country is about 250, 60 years old. God allowed 600, 700 years sometimes to give people an opportunity to turn. Talk about patience. You can't even get through the, the light without getting angry at your neighbor. So God has a lot more grace than we ever do. And so God is full of love and compassion. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. So anyone that tells you that the Old Testament is an angry, that's not an angry book. It's the most compassionate book ever in the planet. And what God has done through history is absolutely amazing. What about when they wipe out those towns? That's for next week. <laughs> All I have to say about that is I'm going off the script here for a few moments. Sometimes I do that and people come up to me and say, you know what, that really touched me. So sometimes I do that. Maybe some of you have a question in your mind. What about all the things that we did in the United States? What about the bombs we dropped on Japan? Nothing in the Old Testament comes close to that. So before we start judging the Old Testament with our 21st century eyes, we need to understand something. We're not all that either. And, and the Bible records what, what man did and how they lived with God and how they screwed up. Not everything reported in the Bible is endorsed by God. He tells the story. And that's the why I believe in the scriptures, by the way. It shows people like you and I that are human that have made a whole bunch of mistakes. And God, despite those mistakes, still works through us and brings us redemption. Despite our ignorance, he works with us. I'm very glad God does not give me what I deserve but gives me mercy and grace and opportunity to change. Amen. And so before we cancel the entire Old Testament, we should all be canceled right now. 
So people that are canceling the Bible, well, you can't, you know, they used to wipe out villages. Yeah, really? You're wiping each other out with your mouths. Look at all the hatred and violence going on in our culture today. The Bible was incredible. It was the most unique culture, and the, and the Word of God is so much better than the surrounding cultures. It was a light. It was, an, it was a lighthouse of, of justice, of honor, of grace, and of power. And if you want to know God's love, God's love is amazing. And I'm telling you, I've read the Bible over and over and over again, and I see God's love in the Old Testament as much as I do in the New Testament. It's not, it's not the angry God and the nice God. No, it's all one God. So, that's for free, by the way. I didn't, there was some, okay. The other service didn't get that, so you guys are more favored than the other one. <laughs> you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you, uh, the native among you. So he's talking about immigrants. People that are going through your country, they're going through a hard time. He's even saying, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. That's amazing, everybody. This is the Old Testament. Hello. And you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You must do these things. Now, in Matthew 5, 43, 48, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. First of all, who is your neighbor? I'm so glad you asked that question. There's a whole passage of Scripture where a man was trying to justify himself. Well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus gives a parable in Luke 10 about the Good Samaritan. Almost everyone has heard the Good Samaritan. It's a part of our, it's a part of our colloquialisms. It's part of what we say. It's a phrase we use in our culture today. What is the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan was a parable that Jesus told about how you are to treat your neighbor. Samaritans, by the way, uh, uh, were hated by the Jewish people. They were half-breeds. They took the law and, and they took the worship of God and they twisted it. They were hated and loathed. There's nothing worse than a, than a half-sister or half-brother that you hate. And they hated each other. The Jews would pray against them. The Jews would walk around them. The Jews wouldn't even look their way when they went past them. They hated them, worse than the Romans, worse than anybody else. They hated these people, except maybe for tax collectors. Those, those guys still take the top tier, and they still do today when it comes to April 15th. So Jesus is talking about that. He talks about a, uh, a man that was beat up by robbers and laying by the side of the road. And here comes a, a Levite, which would be a church worker assistant pastor, walks by, ignores it. Oh, I'm not going to touch that's dirty. A priest comes by. I'm going to ignore that. Then comes a Samaritan. Then comes the guy from the wrong side of the tracks, someone who is a sleazeball in that culture. And that good Samaritan, the hated one, will go next to that man, picks him up, puts him on his donkey, pays for everything he does, takes care of him, makes sure he's healed. And Jesus asked the question, tell me, who's the good neighbor? Well, I suppose the Samaritan was. Go and do likewise. So what does that mean? Your neighbor are even people you hate. Your neighbor could be someone on a different political aisle than you. Your neighbor could be somebody who is fundamentally against everything you stand for. Your neighbor may be someone that's trying to sue you. Your neighbor may be someone that you can't stand. The Bible says you are to love your neighbor you shall love your neighbor and not hate your enemy as the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're sad, you see, because they don't understand. Okay, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say you, sh you to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Now, this is tough, everybody. People that want us to do bad, that want bad to be upon us. <laughs> that's what he's saying. And, and people that don't like you, you're to love. This is hard, right? This is not easy, everybody. Let's be honest. We struggle with this. I mean, you can't, if someone cuts you off going onto an exit, you want to, you want to kill the person. As, as a joke, I'm not saying, you know, when someone cuts you off, you get upset. You guys are just so righteous. Uh, we can't even move on here. Goodness gracious. But I say to you, love your enemies. The question is, what is love? Love is perhaps the, one of the most weakest words in the English language. We have one word for love. I love dogs. I love ice cream. I do love babies, by the way. I, I love pizza. I love God. I love Jesus. 
I mean, let's be honest. We, we use that, we throw it around. Oh, I'm so in love. Oh, how about this one? I don't love you anymore. Or how about this one? You've lost that loving feeling. Oh, that loving feeling. You've lost that loving feeling and it's gone, gone, gone. Boom, boom, boom. Right? I mean, we have cultures surrounding it. Love is a feel. I'm so in love. I don't love you anymore. I fell out of love. I fell into love. It is so lame. Love is like some feeling that you get. And you get it, and you, it's like getting the common cold. You, 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 you get it, and you get rid of it. You know what love really is? And love in this passage is the word agape. There are different words of love in the Greek language. We're not going to break it down all right now, but I'm going to talk about the love that God has is agape, self-sacrificing love, a love without strings, a love that will love you despite what you do. It doesn't make a difference. What you do, I'm going to love you. And if you've been a parent, you understand a little bit more like what it's like to have that happen. You're going to love your children. That's my child. I love it. Agape, I'm going to love you regardless of what you do to me. That's what agape love is. Now, agape love is not just a feeling. As Boston says, it's more than a feeling. <laughs> love is an... I know I'm having fun. Name that tune. <laughs> love is both an attitude and an action. There are people that do things that look like love, but they, they don't have the attitude. And there are people that say, I love you, but you don't help anybody. Is that really love? The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. So if you love someone and don't tell them, you should tell them. We should show the love of Christ wherever we go. So it includes an attitude and actions. So you can, we, we should be both. That's a two-pronged thing. It's like two legs. You need actions and you need love. An attitude, that's correct. So that's agape. That's what we're talking about here. And what Jesus is talking about here is agape love, loving and what is the best definition of love? I, I wish I could do better, but I can't. So I'm inviting the Apostle Paul to come and give us a little bit of a teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which defines what real love is. It's not some sappy feeling. It's not an air supply song. It's not, I'm dating myself. It, it, what love is, it is an incredible, the most powerful, the most wonderful thing there is. And you know what true love is? True love is, true love is God personified. That's what real love is. Everything else is a facsimile or a little characteristic of the main source of love. The main source of love is God. And here's what it is. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and knowledge and have all the faith as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but I have not love, I am not a thing. That means nothing. Love is, here it is, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. Uh-oh. Resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends because God does not end. True love is God personified, and it's Jesus Christ. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, you want to know how mature you are? How well do you love? When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, and reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall be known fully, even as I have been fully known. So now... Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love, agape. Amen. Now, that is about as clear as you can be. It's not just a feeling. 
We worship the God of feelings. Love is more than a feeling. Love is a decision you make. Love is not love until the love feeling is gone. Love's not love until you have to love someone you hate. I don't care if you wake up in the morning and you look at your spouse and you think they're a louse and you want out. I don't love them anymore. You made a commitment to love and your love has not been tested until the feeling goes away. Now, are feelings important? Yes. Feelings are like buzzards on your dashboard of your car. If the gauge is on red and there's steam coming out of the engine, you better turn off the engine and go to your local garage and get it fixed. Are emotions important? Yes. If you've lost that loving feeling and you lost all love for that person, there is a problem. However, your life is not based on feeling. It's based on decision. And love is not some sappy, wimpy, whimsical thing. It is a powerful force to be reckoned with. It is a decision. It is when everything else is wrong. When you hate somebody, that's when love really is tested. Are, are you following me, everybody? Yes. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy enemies love uh, now this is not the greatest sentence in the world but i like it so i'm going to use it love creates not wimpy but warrior okay love I, lo I love you it's okay go ahead no love is a warrior real love creates warriors people that stand up for truth and love love is fierce love is powerful love protects love cares about injustice and makes things right without love i mean god loved us so much that he had to bring justice through jesus christ and jesus took our place on the cross you see in saint Telemachus, uh, back in uh, 391 a.d there was a monk who was coming back he came to rome he was away for a period of time he went to a roman roman games it was the bloodiest thing go going on in that day uh, supposedly rome became a christian nation at that time so to speak but they still had blood sports and they love they had something called bloodlust now i don't think we have that in our country today do we will we get entertained about seeing well it's, oh, it's only made up so they loved blood they, by the way you heard of lust for for sex there, there is a lust for blood that can become in, contagious where society loves violence and loves killing and this is what it was going on people were gathering in these arenas and they'd have these gladiators fighting each other killing each other and they would go like this to let them live or not live and they enjoyed it they would go home and they would have blood all over the place well this guy Telemachus was some sort of uh was some sort of monk and he walks in the little guy walks in to the arena walks on the actual playing field and tells these gladiators to stop in the name of Jesus. The people in the crowd were like, oh, this is a good act. They thought it was part of the act. According to what I've read and even Ronald Reagan's rendition of this that he said at a prayer breakfast, what happened was they ended up killing the guy and his blood was on the floor. And then all of a sudden there was a hush in the crowd and the emperor knew something was wrong. And because this man was a warrior of love. Is that wimpy to go into an arena, to go on the playing field and say, this blood loss is wrong. I will not stand for it. In the name of Jesus, stop. And he was killed. When you and I stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, stop the violence, stop the hatred, stop the killing, from the most vulnerable of our society, we're going to be hated. But we must be warriors of love. And not wimp out at all. We're the most vulnerable of us. We can see what's going on in our culture right now with this whole abortion issue. Let me just say something real quick. If you've been a part of an abortion, either participated in it or had it done to you, God loves you. There is forgiveness of sins. Jesus forgives people from this, okay? We're not here to condemn anybody. But to kill an innocent human life and say it has no value puts a curse on our country. There's a reason why these violent acts are happening. 
we got blood on our hands, everybody. God is removing his hand and saying, I'm going to give you what you want. My friends, we need to stop this. We need to stand for the un unborn. We need to stand for those that are alive. We need to be like this monk in the name of Jesus, stop. But we are not to do it in a political way. We are to be biblical, not political. Amen. And so we have to stand. That's part of love. Love protects. And this is what this man did. You've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Spite, treat you like nothing. Pray for them, the word of God says. You know what Jesus did when he was on the cross? He was not on some big hill, way up aloft in the air. No, he was about, uh, a lot of people would believe, uh, archaeologists and theologians would say, he was probably about uh, maybe like this high up, and you could walk up to him, look him in the eye, and spit on him. You could pluck his beard. And so Jesus was hanging there where the animals could come on. People would spit on him, right? And what happened? And Jesus, what did Jesus say when he was on the cross? Father, let the burn in hell. Is that what he did? No. no? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide us. He was naked, exposed. They had his garments that they were casting lots for, the utmost of disrespect. And here's Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. Was Jesus wimpy? He was a warrior. You see, he had strength that was under control. We have this idea that, no, when you're nice to somebody, you don't do it because you're weak. You do it because you're strong. I'm a child of God, and I'm going to love you despite this. And so Jesus was very powerful and was very strong. And falling to his knees, there was the first martyr of the church. His name was Stephen. Started out in the church serving widows. Not a very illustrious career, but he served the church until he raised up in the ranks, not because he, they, he wanted to, because he loved God. He became an evangelist. He began to preach the gospel to the Jewish people. An amazing sermon. He began to tell what happened and how he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth in love. He was a warrior of love. He spoke the truth. We must speak the truth in love. While he was talking, they picked up stones. And Stephen was the first one to begin to throw stones at him. And, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this against them. He's sitting there. Lord, do not hold this against them. As stones are being thrown upon him, as he's dying, as his blood is coming out, he's losing consciousness. He sees the throne of heaven. And he's dead. And there's a young man there a very well-known rabbi named Saul who would become the Apostle Paul. It says in the scriptures, he saw it. And I believe that was part of the seeds that helped bring his conversion. You see, everybody, that's love. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 10, and we, again, this whole sermon is 5, 6, and 7. We go back to Matthew 5, 10, where he talks about love your enemies, and he repeats himself about this. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, everybody, the only way you and I can navigate through this life, this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, aside from knowing Jesus Christ, is you have to keep your eyes fixed on eternity for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. This is when you honor God and you do the right thing. You may not see it on the first quarter, but the fourth quarter is already done and God won. We don't see the whole thing, but the best is right ahead of us. You see, heaven is before you. Rejoice when you do good. Because one day you're going to receive a reward. For the joy set before me endure the cross. Rejoice and be glad, for reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus, going back to what we, as we finish out the passage today. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father. Are you saying that we have to earn the right to be sons of the father? No, that's earned through Jesus Christ. 
The context of this is this. You'll begin to look like your father. Well, you look kind of like your dad. I've had people tell me that. The older you get, the more I look like my father. It's kind of scary. Anyhow. But seriously, I mean, you look like your father. You act like your dad. People should see Christ in us, right? And pray that those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and unjust. The Bible says his kindness leads to repentance. Right now, there is, there is, people are experiencing good things that don't love God. But one day, that's going to stop. God gives grace to those who don't know him yet. God gave grace to you when you didn't know him either. So God gives grace to both the just and unjust. It's part of it. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do this? The tax collectors were Jewish people that would betray their own race and charge, if you owed $40, let's say, they would charge you 60, and you had to, you had to whittle them down. They said, okay, uh, I want you to charge 50, and they would take the money. And we were tar- terrible people. They were hated. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? You know, we've had some situations where I understand what it's like. You know, it's the old junior high lunch table where there's that person sitting by themselves. I'm going to sit with my friends. I'm going to hang with my friends. You come to church, and I see someone I know. I see, I see someone I know. I want to go talk to them. I don't want to talk to the other person. I don't like the way they look or dress. I don't like that person. I'm going to go talk to Eli instead. So I go talk to Eli. Meanwhile, something inside of me says, go to that person. I don't want to go to that person. There was a person in our old, old church many years ago named Charlie Dudas. And uh, Tom knows him. He's in the back there, Tom and Heidi. Pastor Tom knows him. This guy wore a tie no matter where he went. He cut his lawn with a tie and jacket on. There was a picture of him at a men's retreat with a tie and jacket on while he was in his bunk bed. <laughs> guy was awesome. And he was one of the best ushers I ever did. He just loved people. And, and so one time this couple came to my dad's church, and this is what they said to each other. If anyone gives us a crooked look, we're out of there. And they weren't, quite with, they weren't even believers yet. And they come in, and guess who greets them? Charlie does. Doesn't go to his friends, goes to somebody else. They come the second week, third week. They get elected to Christ. They become members of the church, and their life was transformed. Why? Because someone cared enough to greet them. You don't recognize, maybe at a grocery store, someone that's taken too long to go through their purse to pay the person behind the, the clerk behind the desk. Maybe it's someone here in church that I don't want to talk to that person. Let me go to my friends. How about the Holy Spirit says, go to that person? You see, God might bring someone to our church that's watching online and has enough courage to come in. And why don't we make it easy for them to, to fall in love with Christ by you being the body of Christ? God has designed you to reach certain people that no one else can reach. And so if we can't do it here in this safe environment, how are we supposed to do it out there? So, greet your brethren only? No, look for someone you don't know. You know what I've done, and I, I, again, I, I encourage you to do this. Maybe you go to a store and you have that extra money in your pocket or someone behind you. Why pay their bill? Play it forward, as they say, and then say, you know, hey, I just want to let you know God loves you, cares about you. We're talking to a woman in our small group and how she began to minister to the person in line. If God can utilize you, everybody, greet your brethren only, but what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the so? Therefore, you shall be, here's the part I love, be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Does anyone know anyone that's perfect? Uh, yeah, I'm married to one. Okay. Okay, we might as well all give up now. How are we supposed to be perfect? Get, yeah, give me a break. No, we know purpose means Teleos is the Greek word, and it actually means mature and complete. So it's not telling you to, that's a standard. We are to be perfect like God is perfect. That is the goal, to become more like God. And by the way, it's a good goal. The more we become like God, the freer we become, the more joy we have, and that joy that's unshakable by circumstances, joy that's both here and now and forevermore. Listen, everybody, time with God is never wasted. Never wasted. Time with God is never wasted. The more you know God, the more you love him. That's true richness. That's true being a multimillionaire. It means nothing comparing how the love of Christ in you. And so, um, telling us means mature and complete. That's what God wants us to be. You want to be complete and mature. We should be growing to this over and over and over. You know, I was reading a story this past week about Martin Luther King Jr., who was a, if you're not familiar, he, he had a tremendous speech, I Have a Dream, and he was assassinated. Part of the civil rights movement was a Baptist pastor 
Well, one day he came home and there was a burning cross that the KKK, a wicked, horrible organization that thinks that a skin color, you know, I don't need to go there right now, white, nat, you know, these types of wicked people, the KKK, and what used to burn crosses, basically saying, we're better than you. We hate you. We're God's favored nation. All that kind of nonsense, twisting scripture. And he came home one day and he saw that burning cross. You know what he had? He had a suit and tie on. So he got out there and he screamed at the top of his lungs, this has to... No, he didn't do that. He quietly took the, took the cross away with his son right there. And later on, he actually prayed for his accusers. In fact, one of those writings says this. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. You want hate Amen. and violence to cease? We need to show the love of Christ, which is beyond a thought and a feeling. It is void of that completely. It is not thoughts and feelings are part of it, but true love is action. True love is God personified. True love is his body doing the right thing, loving people, loving our enemies, people that you cannot stand, and you make a decision, just like Corey Tamboon, who shook the, the guard's hand. I'm going to do the right thing, and as you obey God's word, God will give you the grace to fulfill it, but you cannot see it until you do it. When Peter stepped out of the boat, he walked on the water when he stepped out. The only way you and I can begin to love our enemies is we had to step out, take that first step in faith. I'm going to show love, though I don't feel it, though I want to divorce this person, though I want to go to the lawyer. I'm going to love my spouse. I'm going to treat my spouse with grace and love because I am called to love. And love is not love until it's hard to love. And this is what we have to do, everybody. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Praise God, I love this. Nope. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, that would be out of context if we actually thought, you know what it actually meant? Back in those days, it was hard to have fires. So they would, you put some coals on someone's head, they would have a container, and they would carry it to their house so they could cook their dinner. So that's a nice thing to do. I'm sorry. I know I used to love that thing too as well. So Jesus is calling us today. He's calling unto us today. You know, I read a story not too long ago about a czar in Russia before they had the Soviet Union. They had czars, like Hank, kind of like kings. And this was a benevolent czar, and he liked to do, he liked to get out of his, his castle or what have you, and he would go and put on peasants' clothes, kind of like the uncovered boss. Ever watched the uncovered boss? It's pretty funny, right? He was kind of like the uncovered boss. He would go through the communities. And one day he went to a drinking establishment, and there was this, this man that was passed out, all drunk, and he walked by and he saw the man wrote a, a letter basically saying, I'm going to commit suicide. I have so much debt I cannot pay. I, I've lost everything. And I'm going to end my life. Well, well, apparently the man drank so much alcohol that he passed out. So the king was there. And the king took his signet ring off and wrote on there, I am paying all your debts. You are free. And put his signet on there. The man woke up and saw there before him, all debts have been paid in full. My friends, that's what Jesus has done for us. You and I are void. We have no money. We have no collateral. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. None of us have what it takes. But Jesus took our place. And while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I don't know where you are today, but the only way we're going to see the world change, you have to recognize the depravity of who you are without God. When you recognize who you are without God and how much God has loved you when you were a complete wreck, then you and I will have a lot more compassion upon people that don't know God. If you look at someone like you're better, you don't understand the depravity of who you are without God. None of us have the merits to stand on our own. It's only because of what Christ done, has done for us, everybody. I'm telling you right now, the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, I am a chief of sinners. We must understand that all of us deserve death, but because of Jesus Christ and because we've accepted his gift, we are free and we're children of God. 
And so we must show love to those outside. Not wimpy love, but powerful love. We must stand in the truth. We must speak the truth in love. And we're gonna be hated by people. But we must stand in love. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me ask you guys a question right now. And, and maybe you have some people that you hate right now. Maybe it's a political party. Maybe some of you are watching three hours of news a night and all you hear about how horrible the other side is and you can't stand those people. And you get on social media and you, and you just lambast different people. That's not what God's called us to do. God says, love your enemies and do good to those that hate you. So Father, today we choose to walk in love. We choose to step away from hate. We choose to recognize if not by your grace, if not by your forgiveness, who of us could stand in the first place? Lord, we see the hatred. We see the, the, the toil. We see the violence in our culture. And Father, we know the most powerful thing we can do is to love you and to love our neighbors ourselves. And Father, we pray we would love our neighbors in Jesus' name.